Tara Dower, it is wonderful to have you on the Single Track Podcast, back on the Single Track Podcast, I should say. How are you doing just a few days removed from one of the greatest endurance feats of all time? Yeah, um, I'm doing pretty well, sleeping a lot, a lot of brain fog. So you're really seeing unfiltered Tara right now because there's a lot of brain fog going on. Um, doing pretty well. Honestly, like my body feels pretty good. If I warmed up properly, I feel like I could go on like a short run. Um, I don't want to, but I feel like I could. This is this is your legendary fatigue resistance on display. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I have to share a quick story. So my wife's due date is tomorrow. It could even happen today, but we're having a girl. Her name is Sloane. And the other day, I just remember giddily running up the stairs from my basement office when I got the notification that you had set the record. And I just sort of said to her, like, Tara is the exact example of who I want her to see when it comes to like navigating this world with passion and resilience and, and lightheartedness to and play. Like, I feel like you really demonstrate playfulness in a great way as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so in regardless of arena, like regardless of where she goes in life, I want her to be able to see you as an example. Um, and then, of course, like you never want to project a life onto someone. But I immediately proceeded to start like planning out my unborn daughter's FKT attempt on the AT in like 2044. I love so that. <laughs> I just I just wanted to publicly thank you for that, too. I know the ripple effects from this are going to exceed mm -hmm. anyone's wildest imaginations. But thank you for that. Oh, yeah. Thank you for saying that. We had a young girl there the last half day of the attempt she was at one of the crew stops and then she was at the very end her name was maureen and she was just adorable she had like little signs that she made she had like our we had like cat ears for the last day everyone was wearing like cat ears and glow sticks and stuff just to party a little bit and she was adorable and i think that's when it really hit me that like i i could have a big impact on like young girls um lives i know for me like there are several women when i was a young girl that i looked up to and thought wow like i could do something incredible and you know one like mia ham you know just as yeah. an example um you see someone like her and you're like wow i can i can do something amazing like it's great to see that kind of representation so i think that really hit me when i saw maureen there i was like wow like this is an incredible opportunity Part of the impetus for this was to raise money for Girls on the Run. Did you end up exceeding the $20,000 goal? Yes. Um, right now, I think it's at around 21 or 22, but Ultra just announced that they're going to match the donation. Wow. So it's going to be 40, 40 something, 42. So I'm 44, <laughs> math. Yeah. But yeah, really Ooh. thankful for that and excited. Yeah, we'll see if we can do our part throwing it in the show notes as well, but oh, an amazing yeah. initiative to run for. And then I think, you know, we were talking offline, uh, you have been very adamant in describing this as a team effort. And mm -hmm. there are people like JP Giblin and Rascal, your mom, there's a whole list of people that made this record possible. And I think we're going to try to do like a crew specific episode mm -hmm. uh, very shortly after this. But is there anything you want to say, I guess, before we do that episode, just about how important the team was and why this requires not just you out there logging the miles? Yeah. I mean, I called myself the race car. That, that's what I was. And, you know, in like, let's say Formula One or like NASCAR, if you just have a race car, you can't win the race, right? You got to have the pit crew who's changing the tires, who's fueling the car. You got to have a driver. You got to have um, somebody who's doing logistics and, um, you know, you just got to have so many people behind you. And that's really what it was. Like I couldn't have done this alone. And that's like in the name supported, but I don't think like, even if I had like a small crew doing like basics, that wouldn't be possible. It wouldn't be possible. So I had like the crew is doing everything. And all I was doing was listening to them really there was a point around new jersey or new jersey a little bit before that where like we realized we really have to start like we start we need to start like putting down bigger miles because um i think warren doyle has this like pretty cool pretty cool statistic um let me try to find it real quick on his sure. uh, instagram page um or sorry, not Instagram, on his Facebook page where he talks about like the um, mileage, like the average 
mileage difference um, between me and Carl at different points in the attempt. Let me try to find it real quick. It's pretty 10 cool. days. I think 10 days in, you were like 115 miles back, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, I was pretty far back. Um, so yeah, so uh, this is Warren Doyle. He's um, really prolific, prolific figure in the Appalachian Trail world. Um, he said, Tara's about, this was on, this was five days ago. He said, Tara's about 12 miles behind Carl. After her first 10 days, she was about 100 miles behind Carl. Tara, the first 10 days, I was averaging 42 miles a day. Um, Carl's first 10 days, he was ad- averaging 54 miles a day. The next 26 days, I averaged 56 <laughs> miles a day a day and then uh carl averaged 53 so essentially like around that point we were like oh crap we really have to like we have to we have to get going um and so i didn't know if it was possible like i was like i can't do because that rascal was asking like 58s out of me and like we from that point on we were doing like no less than 56 a day i remember a 56 day felt easy i was like oh thank goodness a 56 mile day thank you rascal but like we were doing 58 60s 57s 59s and every day was so hard but i just every day it was just like waking up trusting trusting the crew trusting their math and just being like all right i just got to do it if this is if this is what it takes i got to do it and so without just simply without their encouragement i couldn't have done it and then um you know we had we had people doing everything so we had amy and steve and fresh grounds and my friend flipper they were like you know subbing in and out but they the four of them um they were providing food they were making food they're making sure i was eating the right things and i was um properly i was getting the proper foods and like calories and macros and all this stuff that i'm not familiar with fat and proteins like i'm not familiar with what it takes so they were feeding me then there was my pacers so many pacers just like i can't name them all but like you know just some that come to mind is grace and rascal and jp and kenny and um hunter there's just like so many um then my mom, who was just doing everything else under the sun, who was like prepping pacers and crew and who was like prepping the uh, crew areas and um, driving to locations, doing laundry. Um, like, honestly, it would not have been possible. And that's why, like, when we had talked, I was like, I really want to do this with the crew because, like, it is not I, – I just – I I say I just ran like that. Yeah, it's hard, but I was really the one that was just like traveling. Um, and I call the drivers, like I like to call the pacers, the drivers of the car. <laughs> They're the ones like leading me. And like, you know, at times I'd be like, can you go in front of me because of the spider webs? And then at times I asked them to like go behind me because there was a lot of yellow jackets. We actually all want to get yellow jacket tattoos because there's so many. So I would disturb the nest. I was the first one through and I would disturb like the yellow jacket nest. And then the pacer behind me would get stung. There was, we had, I want to say like 10 to 15 bee stings from pacers on this trip. Oh no, no, sorry. My one pacer, Sarah got 20. And at one time she had to go back because she uh, wanted to anaphylactic shock and she had to run three miles back and I did the rest of the section together. So yeah, that, that was, I mean, just 20 right there. But like, other than that, like some people got like a couple here and there. And so I like to say like pacers are drivers, uh, crew, they were the ones feeding and fueling me. Honestly, it would not have been possible without them. You mentioned the early deficit you had, and I know from pre-effort interviews that you were going into this wanting to be the hunter instead of the hunted. So that mm-hmm. that's a great mentality to enter with. But how how easy was it for you to intentionally give up that much time early and then assume that at day 10 or 11, you would have the confidence to start chipping away a couple miles a day? I mean, again, honestly, I was like at one, when I was going through the whites, it was so difficult that I thought like, oh, it's not possible to come back. Like there's, there's no way I can come back. I was doing like 30, like high thirties during the whites. And if you look at Carl's stats, he was doing like 40, 50 miles in the whites. And I was like, nope, I I can't, I can probably do Sobo. I can probably do women's record if I work really hard, but I can't come back from like being behind that much um yeah i like 
to I like to hunt, but I thought I'd be like 35 miles behind him, not a hundred something miles behind him. So like I asked Rascal one day, I was like, so like, what, where am I? And she was like, it doesn't look good, but we're going to work on it. We're going to contact, like we had contacts with Warren Doyle and Carl Meltzer. And so they just kind of made a plan and we didn't know if it was possible, but every day Rascal just put up put up big numbers for me to do and somehow I just got it done with a little sleep <laughs> that's what it was so like yeah I, to to be honest like I I just I didn't really know if it was possible but why not just try why not just like every day give it your best and sometimes I'd find myself being weak and like thinking about the future and I know that's where I go wrong like if I start thinking about the future or think about the next day oh I have to do 58 again oh my gosh then that's where I start like breaking down mentally so I just stayed in the moment and thought every day I'm just going to give it the best I can and you don't know if it's possible if you don't try so might as well just like every day just give it your best every moment give make it your best mile and hopefully it works out how often, or this is a weird question, but what percentage of the last 40 days do you feel like you were very present minded and not really reflecting much on the past or the future, but like all you cared about was who was pacing you, what you were eating, the music in your earbuds, the podcast, whatever. How often in the last 40 days was I present? How often? Yeah. Versus like the anxiety of like, oh, I need to do this much or like, you know what I mean? Like just reflecting yeah. on the situation. 80% of the time, I would say towards the end, the last 20%, um, I was pretty anxious about hurting myself because I was getting close and we were getting really close to Carl. And I was like, oh, wow, this is, it's working. Like we're, we're nearly there. We're, we're catching up to him. It's actually happening. But I thought, I was like, I could mess this all up. Everyone's doing their job. Every, everyone's doing their job so well. And I could fall and break my kneecap and it could be all over. And I was I was not very present for the last bit because I was so nervous about falling. And I ended up walking like the last, pretty much walking the entire last like six miles because I like took a really bad fall um, eight miles before the end. <laughs> I was like, gosh. I had a really bad hallucination coming off Blood Mountain. I and then after that I fell really bad again or yeah, I fell bad around 30 miles before the end and I was like things are starting to get weird and thing I'm starting to like break down and things aren't going well at this moment. Um I need to focus. I had a hallucination like a incredibly vivid hallucination of Liz Sturstein, my friend Liz sitting on a stump Mercury. just sitting there like looking at me and I was like, Oh, this, Hey Liz, like this is normal. I didn't say hi to her, but I saw her there. I was like, this is, you know, it's like normal to see Liz out here. And then I like came to, and I was like, Oh crap. Like I'm, my mind is going, going other places. Um, so I think I was really nervous at the last 20% of the trail that I was going to fall. I was going to hurt myself. Um, but throughout I was pretty present, pretty, pretty, stoked on who was pacing me we always had a good time unless I was um in pain or mentally fatigued and I was crying like we always I always had a pretty good time with the pacers and we switched it up so often that um you know it wasn't like the same person for more than 30 miles I have so many questions around preparation strategy execution etc but um the last time we had you on the podcast, it was just one of those short, like pre Javelina interviews, and we didn't get too deep into background. And I'd love to get into some of that here, starting mm -hmm. with your history with the Appalachian Trail. So I vaguely know about this 2019 through hike. Didn't realize you tried in 2016 as well, but um, speak to that. Like, what were some of the important experiences, impressions, memories you've had on this trail that queued up wanting to go for an FKT? Yeah, I think there's a lot of contributing factors um i think the main so i don't have to go back all the way in history but like i mean i've had such a long history with the appalachian trail it started everything in like what's going on in my life right now the appalachian trail started everything um i remember one time there was 
a it was going on my first ever section hike in 2014 with a friend and her friend I didn't know and her friend was like hey um me and this other the person we were going with my friend we're both in ROTC and we do a lot of rucking so you probably won't be able to keep up with us and I was like Oh, all right. Challenge accepted. And I made it my personal goal to keep with keep on his heels the entire section hike. <laughs> um, so that was just the first section hike. And I, I mean, I'm incredibly competitive. Um, so after that, I was like, okay, 2017, I'm going to through hike and had a panic attack 80 miles in really bad panic attack in my tent. Um, felt like something was sitting on my chest and I thought it was something deeper than just a panic attack. Um, I had a migraine and just couldn't get catch my breath and was really scary. I ended up getting off the trail and didn't come back till 2019 after working on my anxiety and finished the through hike, um, like delve really deep into the community after that. Um, and ever since then I've been producing videos about the Appalachian trail and like also now ultra running. Um, so I'm still really heavily involved with the community. And then, um, I wanted, you know, mountains to sea trail. I wanted to FKT it, um, in 2020 and did that. And then after in 2020, I was like, Oh, like maybe I, Van, uh, Diane Van Duren, who had the record previous to me on the mountains to sea trail, she was a hundred mile athlete. So I was like, Oh, maybe I can, maybe I could, um, like do a hundred mile race. So I made that my next goal. And that's where the ultra running came from. You know, I just did my first hundred mile race. And then after that, I just like did a bunch of them, really enjoyed it and just got, got really into that community, the ultra running community. Um, the longer the distance, the better. And then it, when I did the, so I've done, you know, a couple, a couple of FKTs. I've done the Colorado Trail, Ben McKay Trail, and I've done Mountains of Sea Trail and like a smaller one here and there. But when I did the Bet McKay Trail, which is actually the first proposed route of the Appalachian Trail, it goes from Springer to Davenport Gap um, in the Smokies. And Bet McKay is the guy who, um, essentially, he's like the father of the Appalachian Trail. So when I did the Bet McKay Trail, which is 289, um, I finished at Springer and I thought, wow, I feel like I could keep going. I feel pretty good. Like, yeah, I'm tired and I'm sore and my feet hurt, but like, I could probably go like, way longer and that's where it really hit me i was like maybe i could do the appalachian trail and kind of the motto since 2020 was like you never know if you don't try so i kind of just played with that for a while planned to do it um in 2024 and asked rascal my best friend um somebody who i met in 2019 on my through hike uh and then from there everything's history I mean, you've mentioned a couple of key names, uh, Warren Doyle, Liz Mercury, Durstein, um, Carl Meltzer, Iceman, Jen Farr Davis. Yeah. And I want, I want to highlight Jen for a second, because from what I understand, you, you worked for her in Hot Springs. And yeah. so can you talk about her, how her influence kind of rubbed off on you too? Yeah, in 2020, I, I started a job with Jen before the pandemic really hit us. Um, I was a hostel caretaker for her bunkhouse, and I... Uh, guided backpacking trips in the Smokies. And um, yeah, I, I worked at her gear shop sometimes, but um, was incredibly inspired by her. I mean, who's not inspired by like, what she did on the Appalachian Trail? Um, and like everything before and after that, like her books, I mean, just the way she describes her experiences, it's incredibly inspiring um, and entertaining. So um, it was a dream to start working for her. And we would like, you know, hang out here and there um, shortly, short times, um, was anything like long, but always got to talking. She, she talked to me a little bit before the Mountains of Sea Trail. She talked to me during it. Um, and um, her influence was great. I mean, she, when you see somebody who's like you, like a woman, I mean, just a woman, when you see somebody who is similar to you, it makes you consider the possibility of um doing one of these attempts um and, i mean it's not like it's a consideration like and then it kind of builds off of that um yeah so i would say her influence was pretty pretty prominent and then also like heather onish anderson i started listening to yeah. her books and 
was really inspired by her as well and just like her honesty in thirst and then i listened to her book um uh, mud i get it mixed up all the time mud blazes rocks mud rocks blazes um i get it mixed up all the time but um she like listening to that book during this attempt and also listening to it during the colorado trail was very helpful in feeling like you know these these things i'm feeling i'm not alone in that um she was just very honest. So, yeah. <laughs> you mentioned at the end of the Benton Mackay Trail that you had this feeling of like, I could prolong this. I could keep going. And and that's got to be confidence building for anything multi-day, let alone multi-week. Uh, w- was that sort of the exact moment when you said like, I think one day I want to go for this Appalachian Trail FKT? Or was there a different moment where th- like it was like that was the spark and at some point I'm going to do it? I would say that was, I would say that's a spark. It's really hard to like figure out when that was. I think that was like a, a moment where I was like, I could keep going longer. Um, I didn't know if it was possible again, kind of like wavered back and forth just with life stuff. Like I didn't know if I would like be able to do it. Um, I just kind of like asked around too with crew, like it's a lot to ask for somebody to like follow you for 40 days doing, doing this job. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, w- I would say that was like the, definitely like the seed was planted. Maybe I wasn't all in at that point, but it was definitely planted at that point. How many months or years of work go into starting a top Mount Katahdin on whatever it was, August 12th, earlier this summer? I finished the Bent Mackay around like two years ago, I guess it was. And I didn't really start planning, planning until a year maybe a year and a half prior to the attempt. I remember I asked Rascal at trail days in 2023, which is in April or May. I think it's in May. I asked her if she would be interested in being the crew chief. And I think that like initiated everything. She said like, no at the time. And then she's like, I want to hike the CDT in 24. I was like, you could hike it in 23 and go Sobo. And she did. She hiked the entire thing. And then she was like, I'm down to do the AT with you now. Um, And then from there, I just kept building like the spreadsheets and asking around, talking with Carl, Warren, uh, getting more information. Really started ramping up in 20, end of 23. And um, 24 was kind of a whirlwind with, um, I did a lot of Appalachian Trail recon and I had hard rock as well before that. So I had to also be getting ready for hard rock. Um, so it was kind of whirlwind up until I actually started. Yeah. What if the last, cause I, we, we crossed paths at Scout Mountain up in mm-hmm. Pocatello, Idaho in early June. Mm-hmm. And I just felt like you were living this sort of idyllic life in the van, <laughs> traversing the country, stopping at all the coolest spots as yes. weather permitted. You were doing, I mean, I saw a couple of your YouTube videos where you were out in like remote Maine, checking road crossings, yeah. getting ready for the hundred mile wilderness, et cetera. Um, was life as idyllic as it looked uh, from the outside? Like, can you talk about the three to four months pre, pre-attempt? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I did a lot of recon on my own. I went up to Maine, and that was a little lonely, like, going up there and doing this. And it also, like, kind of started a little bit of imposter syndrome. Like, this is pretty difficult. Like, these trails are pretty difficult. And, well, I was also <laughs> – I was – Sorry about the vehicle traffic in the background. No problem. No problem. Um, I was also post holing because I went up like uh, Grafton Notch and I went up, um, oh, what was it? I went up uh, the Bigelows in May and it was still pretty snowy. And that, you know, that was a little bit of a confidence booster because I made it all the way up Graft. I made it all the way up to the Bigelows and then I went up the other side. And both of those took, it took about, eight hours to do both of those sides. And I thought, Oh, if I could do this in the snow, like I could, I could do it not in the snow. So that was a confidence booster. But otherwise, like I was a little, like I felt a little bit of imposter syndrome. Um, I try to do as best I could to like get my, um, routine down, like soaking my feet after I did these big runs, I would like soak my feet, wash them, do what I would do on the Appalachian trail. Um, but I don't know. It just, I think I like struggle immensely with imposter syndrome 
Um, and even right now, like I'm still processing this entire attempt, but I'm like, did I just freaking do that? Like that, that doesn't make sense. Like, how did I do that? And I know it just came from a lot of hard work, but then like, yeah, I think, I think it did look pretty idyllic because I don't, I don't really like, I guess I don't really show like when I'm feeling like sad or lonely. Um, yeah. then I started making my way out north or sorry out west and that's when i started seeing a lot of friends and that's when i i saw all of y'all in pocatello and that was like the most people i've seen in like a long time and so it was a little overwhelming it was like so many friends <laughs> um but yeah that was a good time too that was fun and then i made my way to colorado start uh to start training for uh hard rock I mean, it's not a high publicity event. I mean, Luke Nelson puts on an awesome race, but that was one of my favorite finishes to witness in an ultra this year was, I think it was you and Kat who ended up winning the race. Yeah. I mean, it was neck and neck and like Mike McMonagall, Leah Yingling and I were all sort of walking out that driveway finish to go do our own run. And we just see both of you hard charging. It was theatrical. It was awesome. Yeah. She uh, really, she kicked it into gear once we got on the road. I was ahead of her and then she just kicked down. I was like, damn darn it yeah. <laughs> i lost that one can't win them all she's she's an incredible um, runner she kept with me and you know we were back and forth for all the entire race it was an exciting exciting race so i do it and it's exciting are you putting together like massive spreadsheets and notebooks before oh. this and, and what do those include mm, yeah so i had like this trail bible so i called it i had all the stats for all the records I wanted to go for. So like if the overall, I had the overall record stats, I had Southbound stats and I had um, women's record stats. Those are all the ones I wanted to go for. So if it didn't work out overall, I'd go Southbound and then um, go down to women's, um, which all of those records are incredibly difficult. It doesn't, I mean, they're all like high forties, 50 miles per day. So they're not like, one's not easier than the other um, in my opinion. But yeah, so I had the stats of that. I had, you know, towns that were nearby, no more than five miles, because I didn't want to leave town. I didn't want to leave the trail often. I didn't want the crew to get too far. So I had trails that were all the amenities in a town um, and how far it was from trail. I had, um, you know, routines. So like in the mornings, the morning routine, the daily routine, the night routine. I had, um, Every single road crossing, I made notes on every single road crossing, like the accessibility and um, if it, how many cars it would hold, um, the coordinates of each road crossing. I had, um, what else did I have? I had a lot of, a lot of spreadsheets, a lot, a lot, a lot. <laughs> Those are the ones I can remember, but it was like, I mean, it was thick. It was like, it was like about two inches thick, an inch and a half, inch and a half, I would say. I mean, one of the takeaways for me is even though you were outsourcing a lot of this thinking ultimately to the crew while you were executing, there's a lot of homework and a lot of numbers and logistics that you are taking ownership of in the months and years ahead, which is incredible. Yeah, I wanted to prepare, have as much information for the crew as possible before we started. I want to do like all of the leg work beforehand so they didn't have to um go searching for anything i made them there was a document i made for like helpful contacts after i had finished or after i had started so if like because i wasn't able to answer anything like somebody would ask me something and i would literally say like i don't know because i did not know i can't i can't help you right now like there's no way i could like help you so i had my passwords for everything i had helpful contacts like Carl and Warren for logistics. I had my friend Michael, who's good with electrical systems in the van. I had, um, you know, my coach Megan who could help with like pretty much anything, um, to do with like, um, you know, medical or just like coaching in general or like, uh, strategy. And I was like, these people will help you. I cannot, <laughs> cannot help you in any way beyond that. So as a fan, from afar, I was worried this summer because I knew you were going for the FKT, but then I also saw your racing schedule. But then I had a second thought and I was like, you know, we're in this really interesting era of ultra running, especially at your level of the sport. I looked last year, for example, at what Courtney did doing the triple, like she could really stack a lot into her summer and there was still excellence there. 
was that the type of thing you were rationalizing and, and using as an example of, of what's possible? Or um, did you think like, oh, well, I'm doing hard rock and like, this could be a risk? Yeah, I think I thought it, it could be a risk because everyone's telling me that like, I shouldn't do hard rock or I shouldn't do the Appalachian Trail. I should do like one or the other because they could impact each other. So I decided like, I, I knew that nobody had really done that before done a hundred mile race so close to the Appalachian Trail FKT um and I thought like well like we don't know if that's helpful or not what if that's like super duper helpful because one I was I think it was helpful I in my head I like to tell myself it was helpful if you think to yourself like oh my gosh I'm gonna ruin my body like this is gonna be so hard and this is gonna hurt so much like And then I'm going to get on the Appalachian Trail. I'm going to be tired. Like if I start thinking that way, then obviously it's going to impact me. But if I think in the way that's going to like encourage me, like one, this, I'm going to be acclimated for 10,000 feet going to Maine, which is like five, I'm getting up to 5,000. I'm going to be pretty low for most of the time. Like that's pretty good. I'm going to have mountain legs. That's pretty great. I need mountain legs on the Appalachian Trail. So honestly, like thinking, I was like, this could be a really good opportunity, a good training run for the Appalachian Trail. And it ended up being that way. I mean, it it worked out and I wasn't like super tired. And when I started at Katahdin, I felt fully rested and I felt ready to go. Um, I didn't really think about like anyone else. I just thought like, like, what if you just like, try and see if this like works out that would be stellar if it did and then it's a lesson if it didn't (laughs) maybe and again i'd be curious to know what you think here but is any training specificity required for this or even at this level with this new record you can kind of like hike your way or just work your way into shape you know five or ten days in yeah i think people have different strategies like heather um, I think, I don't know if she did this for the Appalachian Trail, but I know she did this for the PCT where she like walked herself into health and walked herself into like getting used to those miles, um, during her attempt. And I definitely got in shape, more in shape as I was going, um, as far as specific specificity goes, like, I think I was more focused on hard rock and I thought like that would just translate super well into Appalachian Trail. So it was more hard rock training than anything, which um, with Megan, it just looked like a lot of time on feet, a lot of mountain days, a lot of hiking up really big mountains like Little Giant um, at the end of hard rock at Cunningham. Um, And for me, it also looked like doing a lot of... um, I did like push-ups and ab work, really simple stuff. And I did like, I prepared my ankles pretty well. I did a lot of, um, cause I have weak ankles, I've gotten some sprains in recent years. So I did a lot of like ankle, um, work and knee work and hip work. Um, yeah, so that, it was pretty much just hard rock training. And I thought like that would translate pretty well to Appalachian Trail. Yeah. I think the other thing I wanted to ask about was like, before we get into strategy and execution, when you look at what Carell did or even what like Liz did on her hike or Carl Meltzer, even going as far back as like Warren Doyle, like way back in the day, was there anything that you were trying to improve upon based on what they had said after the fact about their hikes? Like maybe Carell said something about sleep or Carl said something about where I, where I invested in miles. Like talk about that. Yeah. I mean, first, first off is like, I'm, I've always been a big fan of like ultra runners and like FK tiers. So I've always been a fan. So I've always ingested like content as much content as I could on these people. So I have done a lot of research already on a lot of these people listening to podcasts and reading stuff even before I considered doing it. Um, And then I had this special opportunity to actually like know these people and meet them and talk with them. And I think I implemented a little of everyone, everyone's like experiences on the trail into my own attempt. I was mostly a fan. Most, I, I say I'm a, I was a uh, student of Carl Sabe. Like that is, I was a big student about six months before I, I ingested just a lot of content from him. And I mean, I took a lot of what he said into the Appalachian Trail. So he said, like, make it consistent. Every morning you wake up at the same time every day. Cause if you don't, then you'll get behind and you don't want to, you don't want to get behind on like your sleep or, um, so I, I woke up at the same time, pretty much 
except for two days. I woke up at the same time every day um, because of him. I did a lot of foot care, kind of followed his regiment foot care every day. Um, <clears throat> what else did I do? I trusted him hugely when we were in Maine and New Hampshire, when he said like, your body wants to run. It is made for running and you like, it's like, it's going to hurt, but your body wants to run. So literally every single flat, every single down, I forced myself to run. And there was times where I was like, trust, trust him, trust him, trust what he says. And I just, I just ran when it was really hard to run and it worked out really well because my body just got used to that and the running. I just didn't let myself, I, even if I was tired, I just kept, kept running, um, walking and hiking the down or the uphills, but, um, just trusted him eating on the uphills. He, he said that. So, I mean, I was mostly taking everything from him because he has a record, but Liz, I listened to her a lot about, um, specific things from her hike. She was an incredible help. I mean, I have, she's one of my best friends. So like, I get like a direct line to Liz. Um, Jen just listened to her a lot before I started the mountains of sea trail, had a lot of time with her. Carl, I, I would say Carl Sabe and Carl Meltzer are the people I took the most from Carl Meltzer. And I had a lot of long phone conversations prior to the attempt. Um, and he provided a lot of helpful information. Um, and then Warren Doyle, of course, like, um, just like his opinions, he has a lot of opinions and, um, I just kind of trusted him in different aspects as well. I mean, he knows a lot about the Appalachian trail and specifically road crossings and, um, the pace of different sections of trail. So I, I trusted him a lot. So I, I took a little bit from everyone's attempt and just made, like made it into my own little, my own little, uh, catalog. So if people one day want to adopt the Tara Dower playbook on their future ATFKT attempt, you would just say that it's, it's a compilation of like expertise from seven or eight different people that came before you, or is there anything yeah. unique that you threw in? Yeah. Um, I would say the, the thing I added in there that was unique to my attempt was I add people just came out. There were so many people that came out. Um, people came out for, weeks, months, well, month. Um, I forget that it, it wasn't as long as I think it is, even though it feels like it was like six months long. It was only 40, 40 days. But um, I think I just allowed anyone and everyone who wanted to come out and help to come out and help. The community really came together. I think I've always been um, one. I mean, I've always loved the Appalachian Trail community, so I wanted them to be a part of it as much as possible. So I had like like Amy and Steve came out for, I mean, at least there, they were there for four weeks and JP was there for nearly a month. Um, but then there's people that just came for the day and crew just for the day. Like I, um, I guided this mother and her daughter in the Smokies back in 2020. And, um, her daughter had like remembered me and followed me on YouTube. And she like came out and like, she was the one that hand fed me all day. She came to every crew stop and brought me food. She like prepared me all this food and like hand fed me all day. It was very sweet. Um, but yeah, there's just, I think I implemented, I think I like, I didn't allow, but I just like accepted and wanted the community to come out. And I wanted this to be like a community effort, uh, because the Appalachian Trail community is so thick. And I mean, as you know, it's just like incredible. It's incredible. It's yeah. it's inundated with so many people. Um, so I I wanted to implement them. I think you'll find this story funny. So this was probably last fall in Salt Lake City. Karel Sabe right. and Joran, his team, they were touring that uh, PCT film that came out that I think On sponsored, and they did a Q and A after. And I'm like this nerdy super fan that just kind of like awkwardly walks up to Corel and just have like a whole like laundry list of questions. And one of the questions I asked him was, and it was nothing to do with the PCT. It was all about the AT. I said, you know, what was your mindset going in? And he was very simple. He just basically said, I decided before I started the hike that I was going to get the record. And walking the trail was just executing what I had already decided a couple months ago. Mm. When you were standing on Katahdin, did you did you borrow from that as well? Or was there more uncertainty in the air? 
I've had, I've heard him say that too on podcasts and I am, I respect that so much, but I mean, I think, I don't want to put this on all women. I think I have like, I think I, I think I have a, I've always struggled with confidence, especially my athletic ability abilities. Um, I think that's personal in me, but I think for women, I think we haven't had as many opportunities. I don't think we've had as many, um, you know, opportunities to feel like we could achieve all these athletic endeavors and compete with men too. Um, I think it's a little hard to wrap your mind around like, Oh, can I like, like beat a man, like men's record? Like, I don't want to speak for every woman, but for me, it was like a little daunting to think that. And I, I wanted to put all the confidence out there. I definitely like, that's, that was the goal going into it. And I did have a thought, like, why not me? Like I do these races all the time and I beat several men and, you know, sometimes I come first overall. So like, why not me? Why can't I do this? Like, why not? But I mean, if I was to be honest, like I did struggle a lot with the confidence if I, if it was actually like possible to do that. And that's where the crew comes in again. Like they knew my goal and they weren't going to let me, <laughs> they weren't going to let up. They were, we were going to work completely fully hundred percent towards that goal. Um, they specifically rascal really, um, manifested that and she yeah. made it happen. So when we do the team chat, I think you're going to be pretty, pretty inspired by oh, rascal. Yeah. <laughs> I was I literally no. just a race car. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll say this, and I, I'm, I'll be curious to know if you have thoughts here, but I wonder what the ripple effects are, both personally for you and for the community as a whole, when it comes to confidence ahead of time for these attempts. Like, How often will you be one of the great case studies for, um, and I mean this in a good way, like unwarranted confidence at the beginning of something? Like, I, Even if I haven't done it yet, I... I have permission to just say, like, I think this is, it's going to go this way, you mm -hmm. know, and maybe, so how are do you think in like future stuff that you do, you might have more of that Corel mindset of like, here's what I intend to do. And it's just a function of execution at this point. Maybe, maybe, but it's kind of working for me where I'm like, like, so the way I see it is like, I'm, you know, I'm not super confident in my abilities, but, and I always think like, oh, I'm behind because I'm not going as fast or I'm behind because I'm like taking a break here. Like I'm not doing as well because, you know, this or that, or I'm walking at this section. And then after that, I work really, really, really hard to like get back and like, like improve upon whatever I just did that I thought I wasn't doing well on. And I work incredibly hard to get on that level. Because in my head, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not working that hard, but that's not true. Like, I know I'm working, I'm doing the best I can. So I think, I think it works for me where I'm like, kind of, I hate to say this, it kind of works for me when I'm being a little mean to myself. Mm. That makes sense. I'm like, telling myself, I don't tell myself like, oh, you're, you're a bad athlete. Like, I'm not literally mean to myself, but I'm just like, you got to work harder. You got to be better. It's got to be, you got to do better than this. You got to go faster. So I go faster because I think I'm behind. So it's kind of working for me to where I'm, you know, constantly just trying to improve upon this, this, uh, what I think is not, not going too well. Maybe, you know, maybe it's going to be even better if I, if I have that mindset of Carl Sabe, maybe. I mean, one of the early interpretations for me is like because you've used you've used this race car analogy and i i do like the idea of separating the mind or the consciousness from the physical and like like being up in the rafters or in the stands and just pushing this body down the trail i think that i don't mean we still have so much to learn about mental toughness and resilience and i think you're an amazing case study and for all we know for all i know i mean you've lived it like this is this is as good as anything yeah yeah, I mean, you really do have to, during an attempt like this, you really do have to separate your mind and body and you can't, you, you have to be completely present. And luckily I enjoy the Appalachian Trail. I love being out there. I, I was so excited to simply just hike Sobo, you know, just be a Sobo yeah. hiker. You know, that's exciting. I'll be, I'm a Nobo and a Sobo hiker. That's awesome. 
Um, and maybe I'll get the opportunity to set a record. That's really cool as well. Um, I was really looking forward to like when the sun would shine through the trees, the morning sun would shine through the trees and it was just like rays of light. And then the birds singing, I was really excited for different sections of trail. Um, I was excited for the whites, but they were not excited for me. They, it was very hard, very wet and rainy and stormy and very difficult. Um, I was excited for like Max Patch and being with pacers and being with people and being with the community. Um, so luckily I really enjoy the trail. So I was able to, it was a little easier for me to be present than it would be if I was on the mountains of sea trail, which I still really enjoy the mountains of sea trail, but it was difficult because it's a new trail. It's 400 miles of road walking. So being present on that one was a little more difficult. Prior to maybe the final push. So prior to those final two to three ish days, was there a typical schedule and can you describe what like wake up all the way to mm -hmm. sleep later that evening typically looked like? Yeah. So I woke up at 3 AM It was either in the van or we were tenting. So I'd say about, about half the time we were tenting and half the time we were in the van. Um, another thing I learned from Carl Sabe is that you want to have as many even miles as possible. So like a lot of times, like you would see some people who would do less miles or way, way more miles just to get to their vehicles, um, at night. So we wanted to have mm. like as, as many even miles as possible. So rascal and JP would hike in camping gear and, um, what they call a food baby. Uh, Amy would make us a big old dinner in a plastic bag and we have this big old plastic bag of food. Um, and so they'd hike that in, they'd hike tents in and camping supplies and JP would take care of my feet. Um, anyways, that's the nighttime, but anyways, usually three thirty AM or three o'clock AM, I would wake up, I would start my Luco tape. I would start taping up my feet. Um, and then rascal or JP would hand feed me. Um, because I was pretty focused on getting my feet prepared, get my shoes on. I would do a couple of things for warming up. I would do some leg swings and like open up my hips and then I'd start the first hour of the day was pretty difficult. Um, it was warming up the body. So I would try to keep to a three mile per hour pace, but that was, um, really difficult some days. Uh, when the sun would come up, I would about be like nine to 12 miles in for the day. And then would see the crew for the first time around there. And then about midday around one or two, I'd be halfway done for the day. Um, and I would see the crew about, you'd have to ask Rascal, but four to five times a day. So yeah, I'd, I would change my shoes. It was a lot in the beginning because my feet were constantly wet and because um, the freaking rain and Maine and New Hampshire, um, the weather was really terrible. Um, and the rope water crossings. So I was changing my shoes and cleaning them a lot more in the beginning. But then once we got to like about halfway in the trail, I started just changing my socks and shoes about once a day. So I change them once a day and, um, yeah, just keep hiking, keep hiking. And around, it was like eight 30, anywhere from eight 30 to like nine 30, I would finish the day. Um, that was consistent, but Towards the end, I was finishing around 10, 11, 30. There was the last full day was 11, 30 when I finished. Um, but normally it was like 8, 30, 9, 30. I'd finish. I would um, stop. I would stretch. I would stretch. I would do like a whole stretching routine that took 10 minutes. That was incredibly beneficial. Once I started stretching, I was less sore in the mornings and I was more nimble. Um, so stretching is super important. And then I would sit down. My mom uh, would hand feed me and, uh, JP or somebody is usually JP would clean my feet, um, dry them. Then we'd start, a uh, Epsom salt soak. We'd soak the feet and then we'd put a lotion on the feet, uh, like a specific cream. And I would hop in bed and be in bed by, you know, an hour after I finished. So it could be anywhere from like, uh, nine 30 to 10 30 and then, uh, would wake up and do it all again. Two questions off that. First, did it ultimately come to pass that you were doing about four to five hours of sleep a night, or was that was it more yeah. than that? Yeah, um, the most I got was seven, but I've gotten six. Normally, like 
six was a lot towards like when we were really in the thick of it but usually it was like five and a half to five once we started getting to like four hours of sleep we knew it was going to be a rough day like the next day was going to be really rough so we tried our best it was really hard but we tried to keep it you know over five hours of sleep are you impressed by what your body gave you on that little amount of sleep for that long yeah, I am. Um, you know, I think back to that. I think like sometimes I'm really like not mean to myself, but I think I'm a little I think I'm a little more critical of myself. Um, you know, if somebody was doing this, if it was if I removed myself from the equation and it was somebody else doing this record and I saw their stats and I saw everything they did and I even watched them, like I would be very impressed. I'd be like, that is incredible. Good for them. Like that they did great. But like when I look at myself, I'm very critical. And um I just lost my train of thought. But I I guess I'm just like critical. So um it's hard for me to think in a way that's like positive towards my body. Um but Hmm. you know removed it's like wow like my body got up every single day and did like 55 plus miles a day like at least 55 miles 55 mile plus days um and it recovered not 100 percent, but it recovered to the point to where i could do it day after day after day on only five hours of sleep with the research that's yeah. not a lot of sleep especially for this kind of thing so like removing myself from the equation like it is i am incredibly thankful for my body and incredibly thankful for like the crew um yeah i think it's hard to i think it's i think i'm still processing and i think it's really hard to like say like i am proud of my body and proud of myself and that's i think that's going to come to surprise for some people you know i when yeah. especially when i look at fk tears or when i look at people doing these incredible efforts you think their mindset is so strong and you think they're incredibly like um you know, there's no bad days, you know, but I had a lot of bad days and I had a lot of moments and I still am. I have a lot of moments where I'm very critical of myself and maybe that's beneficial. Maybe I could do better on that, but who knows? Yeah. It makes me wonder because we, you know, and again, I, I am so open to all modes and methods, especially in this like exploratory phase of mental, just mentality in sports. And I, you've mentioned that at, at some points, negative self-talk ended up being kind of an asset um how would you ultimately describe the state of mind that is required for this like is it does it border or lean more towards the negative is it positive like where are you, where are you currently coming down on that hmm. i think i think it's better to be positive um I don't think I was like negative. I think I was just like critical of myself. I think that's what being negative won't really help. I don't think that's like the way to go. I think there's a lot of people that were in my arena that were positive and that were, um, helped me stay present. Um, all my pacers, I mean, we, they let me cry. They let me, they let me have really hard moments and they allowed me to feel all the feelings but then we got back to work um i think it requires like i also had sort of this mindset i know this might be like counterintuitive but like i had this mindset of like equanimity and um easygoingness and you know a little playfulness in this (laughs) i wanted to have fun i wanted to have a good time out there i had a lot of fun i did a lot of things that FK tears would probably be like, that's wasting so much time. <laughs> like, why are you, are you going on these sides? What's an example? Or... What's an example? Uh, I climbed uh, the tree at Bly Gap. <laughs> that that windy, ancient sure. tree. Like, I mean, that's. I mean, I could have gotten like what three minutes there, but I <laughs> didn't. I think it does require like you enjoying the journey. Um, I got pictures. I went to overlooks at times. There was times where I missed a lot of overlooks. There was times that I just like blasted through a view, but there were moments where I allowed myself to just sit and soak in some moments. Um, me and JP one morning at dragons, dragons, dragons back, dragons tooth, dragons tooth. Yes. I think that's what it's called. Um, the triple crown. We just like 
watch the sunrise. And that was, I mean, we didn't even care about the time. My average, my pace average was like going up. And <laughs> after that, I was a little anxious. It's like, oh no, I'm so behind. But like, there was that moment where was, we were just sitting watching the sun rise in Virginia. And I look back at that. I'm so happy I did that. But those could be considered moments of like, you know, allowing this record, you know, not being fully invested in the record, but I look back at it and I'm really thankful I did that. Any thoughts of quitting ever? Cause it seemed, again, it seemed so smooth. You, you even when it was tough, it seemed like you were going to kind of finish no matter what, were there ever any moments with the crew or with yourself where it was like, I'm throwing in the towel? No, never. Not once, wow. not even close, not even close. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, no. That's never rare. Thought. I don't, I think yeah. that's unprecedented. Yeah. I didn't ever get there. Like Jen, I, I think Jen has that famous story of, you know, she gets to a road crossing. This was her 2011 attempt. And Brew, her crew chief, basically says, like, she's like, I think I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. And Brew's like, I didn't give up my whole summer as a teacher, you know. <laughs> to just see you quit 10 days into this thing and he just drives to the next trailhead and she has to she has to meet him there and then by that time it's all resolved you know i love that yeah yeah that's usually what it takes but yeah i mean i never got to that point where i wanted to quit but also there's so many reasons not to quit and only keep going um yeah never i mean i had so many people behind me it was more than just me it was more than just me and rascal had moments where she was like having a really hard day and did she quit no she I mean, she did a lot i mean she had a lot of emotional she had a lot on her plate as a crew chief and there was days that she had i mean it was very difficult and she kept going so why can't i do my job and keep going hmm. i remember from the year scott jurek did it that you know and he's such a popular figure in the community you are too um he, but he sort of built an entourage, right? Like people wanted to meet him at trailheads. They wanted to join him on so many of his days. And I think he, Jenny might have taken issue with it, but he kind of liked it. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. for you, you know, A, did you experience that? B, was it welcome or, or was it a distraction? Yeah, I didn't have as many people as him. I read his book and it sounded overwhelming to have that many people with you. Um, yeah, I was incredibly welcomed. People would just meet me on trail. They would find my location with the tracker and meet me on trail. And um, luckily I had pacers with me that I trusted. So it was never like a random person was meeting me and I was all alone by myself. And I mean, most of the people you can trust on trail, but you know, that's, it's a little sketchy, but you know, I always had a personal pacer with me, somebody who knew me and I knew them, um, before this person like came up. Um, but yeah, everyone was really welcomed. Um, it just was like, people would come up and my crew would be like, Oh, Hey, what's up? Are you going on this next five mile section with her? I'm like, yeah. All right, cool. See ya. Uh, here's her food and this is her water and have fun. Bye. <laughs> um people would show up with food like chick-fil-a there was um um oh, mike mahaney who showed up with literally everything i had this on my website i have this list of stuff that you might want to bring like these are the food preferences when i'm in an fkt he literally brought everything on that list every single thing and made like his wife made brownies and like that is so cool and so great like of course that's that's so welcomed i love that when you, before we get to maybe just some mindset and closing thought stuff, I'd love to hear about some of the highlights and lowlights from like a few of the key sections. Like personally, just from what I know of the AT, I always break it up into like the Northeast, the Mid Atlantic, the South, and New England being the Northeast, and like the Whites, Maine, Vermud, et cetera. Um, maybe starting with the Northeast, like do you have a highlight or a lowlight from that section, like a story that comes to mind? whether it's about pace or what you saw or who you, someone you interacted with? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of pacers, a lot of great friends in the Northeast. Arlie Hiskey, who came out, one of my really good friends, my good friend Reese. Um, the, we called them the New Hampshire boys, the fast boys in New Hampshire. They came out, um, they're involved with um, Run New Hampshire. I think that's what it's called. Um, and their, their boss uh, kind of, encourages them to come help these fkt attempts they help a lot and they led me through the hardest day wildcats and um up like carters and mariah um they led me through that time but like somebody and something i remember from the northeast is just scott 
um, I don't know how to say his last name, Benefor or something like that, but he yeah, did. Yeah. yeah, he's incredible, an incredible athlete and an incredible pacer. He was one of my favorite pacers. He led me through some of the toughest sections in the whites with a literal smile on his face the entire time. He's done a winter through hike of the Appalachian Trail. He started in December, so he loves the cold, and it was very cold during those pacing sections. Um, he led me up Mount Washington and back down, and then he also led me through, um, like through Zealand up to, up to um, the Mount Lafayette and um, Franconia Ridge and back down. Okay. And Lafayette was freezing; it was so cold. He before we got above treeline, he knew exactly what to do. He put a hat on me. He put all these layers on me, and he had a plan. He we got fed. We got he watered me and we headed up and it was so cold and he just kept up a consistent pace. Um, that's definitely a highlight from that time. He, I mean, he was, every pacer I had had their gifts and I was incredibly thankful for all of them, but he was one of the best I had. How about the mid Atlantic? Mid Atlantic. So would that be like Connecticut through or Massachusetts through like, like Pennsylvania, Maryland. Oh. Yeah. I would say like um I had some great pacers through that section. Um Rafa and Grace. Grace and I were she was with us for about a week and a half, two weeks, but she and I just like boogied down the trail. She was like always so focused on feeding, watering me and um leading me down the trail and she was a very great pacer. Um, but I think like what stands out from that is when JP finally joined the team in New York and I remember seeing him, I was like walking up this hill and I remember seeing him cause we're such good friends and he's just like, we have so much fun together. Like every time we see each other, it's like, we're riffing all the time. I saw him and like my mood completely <laughs> changed. It was like hot that day and I like come up this hill and I'm just so excited to see him. And that entire day was just so much fun. And, um, he was with us through the end. Um, so I would say like, that was a, that was a highlight and we went through that was a day uh we did about 20 something miles together and that was a day that we went over the hudson river um bridge and we went through the zoo <laughs> the trail goes through a yes, zoo bear mountain yeah and then we went up bear mountain and it was so hot that day but we stopped at the vending machines there and got ice cream <laughs> and it took like that was another time where i was like you're wasting time it literally took like 10 minutes to get because it the freaking vending machine was so slow. It took like 10 minutes to get ice cream. <laughs> um, but we did it and it was, it was a fun day. We had a good time, even though it was like so freaking hot and he didn't tell me, but he like drank no water that day. He wanted to make sure I had enough water. He just like <laughs> dehydrated himself. <laughs> I get the sense just having talked with JP a couple times that he's one of the more selfless people in the mm -hmm. sport. And he really gives himself to whoever he's with either in conversation or in support uh oh pacing you know, he just seems like a class act 100 percent, 100 percent. i mean he was i mean he has javelina in a month and he like was out here up until i mean yesterday just doing or two days ago doing 30 miles at like a 20 minute pace so like is that good training for javelina i don't know maybe <laughs> we'll see when, it, when we get there but he is completely selfless uh, and we he was down to do any sort of miles anything i needed he would do I'm a strong believer. I'm a big believer in karma. So I feel like he'll have that karmic energy. At, I hope so. Yeah. He's got a huge base. Um, He's got a huge base right now. He did like but the bear mountains do is such a trip. <laughs> it's so crazy. To walk be, to be totally remote, walking through just like single file green tunnel and then to pop out and you just see like cheetahs and baboons and lots Bears. of people and burgers. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It was, it was near, I forget it was on the weekend. So there's so many people we like walk through the zoo and there's like so many different kinds of people, perfumes and colognes. People are wearing like strong colognes are from New York. So everyone's like dressed to the nines too. But we turned the corner and there's this couple, like she's like, he's videoing and she's twerking on him. And I'm like, Oh, Hey, what's up? Just walking by here. <laughs> don't mind me. <laughs> it's like, this is something you don't see every day on trail. No. 
<laughs> there is hike naked day though. I remember from oh, my yeah. through hike way back in 2014. There that it maybe rivals that. <laughs> there was a day that I was so high and I was like, I could hike naked right now. This that would feel so freeing and so nice. If there's nobody on trail, I would just take off all my clothes right now. <laughs> How about the south? Like besides the finish, like you know, Grayson Highlands going through uh, the Shenandoahs, et cetera, that whole the priest, that whole area. Yeah, I would say Virginia was just the Virginia and whole, like Central Virginia was beautiful. Um, just those rolling hills, and um, the terrain wasn't easy, but it was just like beautiful. And every single day in Virginia, that's where the sunsets were just incredible. Oh, just so many colors. Um, I would just say Central Virginia was a highlight in the in the South. Yeah. And then I know we're skipping a lot, but I'm sure in subsequent podcasts you're going to get into like super nitty gritty stuff. Uh, going to the finish line scene, like you hit Springer Mountain. Uh, what is the scene like? What are your initial thoughts? Like, how are you processing that whole initial moment? Yeah. Oh man. Um. So about eight mile or seven miles before finishing. I had that last section with JP and Rascal walked me into the finish and I had that section with them. So I was like super excited to spend time with like, um, you know, my mom is part of this, but like my mom, JP and Rascal are some of my favorite people out there. And, um, among others like Kenny and, um, Grace and all these people, but like so excited to just spend a lot of time with JP and Rascal ending this journey. And I had, the worst anxiety leading into it is like, I felt like I was on the verge of a panic attack for the last seven miles. I was like, I don't know what's going on. My heart was racing. I didn't feel mentally well. Um, so I just asked them, I was like, we need to talk about anything, but like what's going on right now. So we just chatted. They tried to like take my mind off of it. We actually had a really good time. We talked about like highlights of the trail. Um, and then about, I mean, the mile, the last mile that you hit the parking lot and then there's the mile before the finish. It just all like, like I was no longer anxious. I was just emotional and uh, like didn't have any panic anymore, but I was definitely emotional and was allowing myself to feel everything. Um, and it just was like one foot in front of the other we got up there there's so many friends up there there's a couple random people up there there was everyone's just really excited touched the plaque and it was over and it was just like facts at that point it's just like touch the plaque and that's the end of the time and sat down with the crew and we just spent time together we talked about our favorite moments and um just did a little i had a little champagne pop just a lot of celebration (sighs) And I will the say photo this. Of the champagne pop was incredible. Oh yeah, that was good. Uh, shout out to Pete Schreiner, who's who did a lot of the photography for this. Um, shout out to him. If you get an opportunity, go check him out. I think his Instagram's Pete Schreiner Photography. He's yep. incredible. Um, but he took a lot of those photos. Um, but you know, up until like three miles to the end, I thought like it it is not a possibility. Like I didn't allow myself to get to the point to where I was gonna like allow myself I wasn't I wasn't like I didn't think I would get it up until like three miles before because I fell so much and I like I didn't injure myself but there was a lot of violent falls um Mm. even up to like the last seven miles we were like a mile in and I fell and it was really bad I started bleeding and that was so bad but I thought like up until the last three miles I was like I'm gonna fall and break my kneecap and not be able to finish. So I was so nervous I was going to do that, <laughs> but I didn't. So, <laughs> you know, your, your passion and love for the trail is unquestionable. I've known that for as long as I've known you. Um, but I think, I think this is an interesting question to consider. How, how driven were you by making the point that this overall record could be held by a woman? I was very, I, I know that women can hold this overall record. I know that they can. And I mean, they do now. Um, I'm completely confident that women have, in my opinion, better endurance than men. We hold a lot. Our nutrition, I mean, it seems to be at the end of trails. Just looking at my through hike, looking at me 
how me and Rascal looked compared to like Jonathan and Flipper who we were hiking with. The the way our bodies like held on to fats and like um looked strong and like like we looked strong and like we didn't look unhealthy. Um compared to them, it looked <laughs> different. Um like just looking at that, thinking of the through hike, thinking about you know the difference between men and women, um, knowing like in my opinion, in my opinion, I think women have a better pain tolerance. In my opinion, mm. uh, you can have a different opinion than that. But um, just knowing all those things, I truly believe that women can, if there's more women that come out and do this trail, we can hold this record for a lot, a lot longer um, than men can. Uh, I'm totally confident in that. I would say like the barriers were just like me personally, my abilities and I like my thinking about my personal self. And I think the a big reason I wanted to come out here is I didn't know if I could do it, but I wanted to inspire other women to try to come out and do it. And luckily mm. I did do it. And hopefully this inspires more women to consider the fact that they could come out here and um, set an FKT, an overall FKT. I was inspired by Jen and hopefully this inspires more women to come out here. How would you say, again, with the obvious points that like you now have an even more impressive resume, you have in my opinion, I mean, if you look at the Appalachian Trail, I would say to the general public, alongside Barkley, I mean, way more so than UTMB or Western States, it has the most like widespread name recognition. I think people can actually appreciate this more than they could appreciate like, you know, a win at any given race in our sport. So that's super cool. Um, but like setting aside all the resume stuff, um, how do you think you're a different person than when you started the trail? Like from standing on Katahdin to standing on Springer, what are like the most immediate differences you notice in yourself if if they're apparent yet hmm. i think i i am more confident in my abilities i think i'm definitely more confident in my abilities and this was like the ultimate test for me personally to see if like this was possible i've heard so many opinions from like so many different people in the community and i just went out there to see what i could do and did it and I know now like just hearing all the opinions of people who are like oh you're gonna be so tired you don't know what you're getting yourself into and I got myself into it and I got myself out um so I think I just I have more I definitely have more confidence in my abilities um I think there's a um there's something I'm missing in life now that I'm off the trail. It's like that, the simplicity, I miss that simplicity of being on trail and just doing those miles and just being, it sounds so like cliche, but being one with the trail, you know, of course, being, of course. I was sleeping in the dirt. I was doing dirt naps and I was completely filthy. I only took three showers the entire time. And, you know, I was happy with that. That was fine. Like I didn't want to, I didn't want to take more showers. Like it was okay. I spent time with so many great people out there. Um, and just like had these raw conversations. Um, I think I might feel more like in tune with who I am as a person, um, without all these extra influences from social media. I remember getting on TikTok last night and just being like, I know it's cliche again, but like not being disgusted, but just being like, oh, this is tiring. Like this is a little yeah. exhausting. This is a little exhausting. Yes. Like this isn't what life's about. Um, and for some people it is, and there's nothing wrong with that. But for me personally, I don't feel, it just feels like a lot of outside influence. Um, and I'm not really looking forward to like being inundated with all of the social media stuff and it's been a little overwhelming being back in off the trail and being back to a point where I have time to look at social media and look into what's going on in the ultra world or looking at you know TikTok and just looking at these random videos and, and I don't have to look at it I don't have to do that but I don't know you just kind of do it um so yeah I don't know I think I'm just a I think somewhere in there somebody can make sense of that that's just how i feel i mean two things come to mind one you know having been a through hiker myself I, I feel like i can empathize to some extent obviously not at the extreme that you just went through but uh it, there is a difficulty in reintegrating back into society and like there's a part of me that wonders even though there was a lot of suffering involved for you is was your day-to-day -day life these past 
40 days actually kind of an ideal life for you? And are you going to miss that routine, even though it required a lot of you versus coming back to the creature comforts of modern society? I know that's a weird question to ask, but like, I mean, a lot of through hikers deal with this, right? Yeah, I think like if I did less miles, I think I would want to be back out there. Like if I was doing 40 miles a day, I'd be like, oh my gosh, get me back out there right now. I mean, it was really hard every single day. I mean, every day was a challenge to do 50, 50 something high 50s every day. Like that was a challenge. But um, like, I mean, Rascal and I slept together almost every night and she woke me up. She fed me. She clothed me. She did everything for me and not that I need somebody to do that but it was just like we are so connected um you know my mom was also there to feed me and encourage me and inspire me um and so like you miss those connections like you you don't have that that same connection and I don't want them to do that now I wanted so badly on the trail to have my autonomy back because so many people are telling me what to do when to eat when to drink giving me food force feeding me and so much so much of the time I wanted my autonomy back but then now I'm at the point where I'm like missing that connection with them um and Russell's actually still feeding me and giving me water and stuff actually so we're still there but once that ends it's going to be a little sad um yeah <laughs> I I think I'm definitely going to miss miss it and I wish you know I could do less miles but if it was less miles, I'd probably want to go back. Uh, I, it's just like people would come on pacing duties and be like, you do not know what's going on right now, do you? I'm like, no. They're like, well, this was what happened at the debate. I was like, oh, that sounds crazy. <laughs> and that has like zero impact on my life. I know. They're in eating some way, the dogs. That, yeah, that's. <laughs> I heard about that. That sounds silly. <laughs> Sorry, I had to inject that in there. <laughs> Um, I mean, here, here's another like weird kind of parting question. And it's, I mean, you mentioned just being inundated with social media, media requests. I know that I am not helping with that. Like I, I often wonder how much harder is the next two months going to be versus the previous two months, because so much is going to be asked of you. And I, and I'll preface, like, I guess the question is like, what do you ultimately do with this accomplishment? And I'll preface that by saying, like, you look at Jen Farr Davis back in 2011, her life totally transformed. Like she got Nat Geo Adventure of the Year, went on the New York Times, CBS Sunday, ESPN, published a bunch of books, became a keynote speaker, built a hiking guide company. Like she really like, she took advantage of it, right? And it's like, what do you do with this? Like, is your mind already spinning with like, like this is a monumental transcendent sport accomplishment. I have like the world in my palm. Oh man. Yeah. Somebody wrote a Substack article talking about this and Matt. Yeah. Yeah. That was really good. Um, but I have no idea. Uh, I would love to do something with it, but, um, I haven't really processed that because I didn't allow myself to get to the point to where I was, thinking I was going to do the overall record. I wasn't going to get it up until three miles before finishing. I didn't really have time to like prepare myself. So I think I'm still just processing it. Um, so I don't know. I don't know what to do with it. Maybe I need to have somebody that helps me with that. <laughs> I mean, also very, you're in rare air. Like very few people have experienced this level of endurance. Like you have, you probably have people on one hand, Jen, Heather, Scott, that you can turn to, to be like in your crew, obviously, but like very few people to kind of sit and talk and reflect with. Like there's almost yeah. nobody at this height of the sport. It's wild. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> so I don't really know. You're, you're asking a lot of good questions. I need to ponder. How about, I guess the last one on the content, like, cause you're a YouTuber, you have an awesome YouTube channel, Terra Tracks. So we'll link to it in the show notes. How much video did you get throughout this? Like I know Pete had the photography. Are we yeah. going to see anything? like long form video come out of this? Yeah. Every single day I took video um, and I'm going to do like daily videos. They're not going to be that great because some days I just took two videos or like one video, but I'm going to post uh, daily videos every day. And I also took um, daily videos on um, like my phone for TikTok or for Instagram. So I have like those videos that I'm excited for because it's cool. It's like at really 
pivotal points like Mount Washington. I took a video and then McAfee's knob. Uh, did I do McAfee's knob? I think I might have done McAfee's, but it was also like uh, the Smokies. Like there's really cool points every day. I took a video of like these really critical times in the through hike or in the um, FKT attempt. Oh, awesome. And this yeah. is all going to kind of be dripped out over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I think I might start the those little like Instagram reels tomorrow, like post post, okay. and they're just very simple. Or just like what's going on in the day. Maybe, maybe one more question. Uh, this is kind of logistical, and if if you don't want to answer this, you don't have to. But like, I just think about what is required logistically and financially to make this possible. Carl would often talk about how, like, with Red Bull, it was like a six figure endeavor. Like, he needed a hundred grand to make the AT possible. <laughs> yeah, I remember. Him how much do you think that this costs? Oh, yeah. Um, so do it I, right. I paid for everything for my mom and for Rascal. And also, um, it ended up where I was um, paying a lot for other Pacers coming in who were spending a lot of time, like JP or Grace or Kenny. Um, I was spending um, you know, money on, the, well, Rascal and my mom had the credit cards. But gas for two vehicles and food for me and other people um i didn't really check my bank account but i it was amy and steve also didn't i don't think they let us pay they bought a lot of food and so so did fresh grounds and flipper which was not yeah. like my choice like i would rather pay them for the food but i don't think they allowed us to um i wanted ten thousand dollars for the entire trip but i i think we might have only spent about five, I have no idea, maybe five to 6,000. Wow. Yeah, I think probably less than that, but I haven't even, I haven't even checked. I just saw my bank statement when I had to pay it one morning on the trail. <laughs> that is real. That is the most real thing I've ever heard. Like paying a credit card <laughs> bill, like while in the middle of a long distance FKT. Yeah. Luckily, that is grassroots. As Warren really Doyle would say, that's grassroots. <laughs> Luckily, I had really good service, and uh, Apple Apple makes it really easy to do it. Oh my gosh! All right, we should leave. We should we should leave on maybe like an uplifting, like truly uplifting note. And that is like, is there anything we didn't cover that you want to mention, uh, like a parting message for the audience, or any anything you want the audience to sit with? And yeah, be inspired I, think, by? I think there's. If you're thinking about going for one of these records, I think having a crew that you can trust and that um, you set up proper expectations with is incredibly important. Don't be afraid to say how you feel um, and set up those expectations prior um, and have a crew member that you can absolutely trust. Um, so you don't have to worry about anything but moving. I think, again, the crew was such a crucial part to this. It was would not be possible without them. Um, and also like, I know it seems daunting, um, but I think more women um, should go after this record because I truly believe that women have, you know, I've said it before, but I think we have a special gift of endurance. And I would just love to see more women going out there to, you know, if it's a dream, great. Like that's a dream and you should go after it. Um, and you never know if you don't try. Um, but if it's, if it's just like an inkling, like maybe I could do this, I think just trying um, I know it's asking a lot. I know it's it's very daunting, but if you have the means, if you have the time, then definitely try. Well, Tara, we I know you're fresh off the the effort, and you probably have a lot of uh, stuff grabbing at your attention and demand. So we really appreciate it. Thank you so much for sharing a bit of the story. And I know we all cannot wait for for more of this to come out. And there's plenty we didn't cover that I'm excited to, to listen in on. So thank you for your generosity um, from all of us here. Just what you did was incredible. I think it was, I stand by it. It was the greatest performance, I think, in ultra running history. And and it's amazing because things like Jasmine Paris's finish at Barkley happened earlier this year. We saw Courtney set a course record at Hard Rock. Katie set a course record at UTMB. Like, I, I think this is it, and I'm excited to see the mainstream impact as well. So, yeah, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much, and thank you for the time. Yeah, thanks for having me.